So, hey everyone, my name is Willem, and I'm thrilled today to stand here and discuss and share my thoughts and insights about why I created my own state machine. So, before we dive into this topic, let me, yeah, take the time briefly to introduce myself. So, I'm Willem Teugels, 24 years old, and a software engineer who's been working nearly two years at Devil Team G Cloud. I'll, so, um, yeah, kind of excited since it's also my first time, so the nerves are also quite high. But I'm quite excited to be here and share my knowledge and insights. So maybe, given a little yeah, extra introduction, I began my journey as programming as a hobby about like five years ago, where I started writing Lua to create yeah, uh, small scripts for a game, well, a game, 5M, which is basically a GTA 5 modification that allows you to kind of use the game as a sandbox and allow you to write anything and use the game as a game engine, basically. And along that way, I learned Python, and that was my go-to language for that time. So, despite having programming as a hobby for nearly yeah, two years then, I never really had the intention of going to study uh, a programming course because, yeah, I guess I was young and naive. I still am, probably. <laughs> So, I first studied graphical design and marketing, but yeah, that didn't last. And then I just decided to look at myself and look at what I, yeah, what do I like when being at home as a hobby, etc. And yeah, that was programming, so I just decided to do a programming course, and yeah, that went successful, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here, I guess. So, during my studies, Python was my main language, and people always, yeah, friends, people came to me and said like, Hey, you should try Go. But yeah, I knew, always was hesitant, but then one day I just, yeah, let's go for it. And yeah, since that day, <laughs> we're still stuck at Go. <laughs> and you, pro you guys probably have the same reasoning behind it. Yeah, the tool chain is easy. It's, the conventions are everything what you expect in a program language. Well, for me it is. The standard libraries are perfect to write whatever you need. So there's not really a dependency on third-party libraries. The error, handler, error handling uh, philosophy is perfect, matches me perfectly the way I want to do things, and just overall the concurrency model. Uh, so what are we going to see? What is a state machine? Why are we using one and diving in the code? But yeah, let me warn you, the, it might sound a bit hard sometimes, but at the end of the day, it's quite easy to just write it. So, let's start. Uh, yeah, I should have used that slide, maybe. <laughs> so yeah, William Turgles, I studied at Thomas More, and I'm a software engineer at Devil Team G Cloud. So, what is a, st what is a state machine? Yeah, what is a state machine? A state machine is also known as a finite state machine. I'm going to say the word state machine quite a lot, sorry for that. But it's basically a mathematical model that describes a system behavior and that can be represented in a finite number of states, so an unlimited number of states. And the states and transitions between them. So what does it mean? Well, why is it useful in software engineering? Because they provide a structured approach to modeling the behavior of your complex system. Well, not always complex, but yeah. So state machines are just particularly useful to write, yeah, well, to write software that have well-defined sequences of events and states, but also such examples as a user interface can be quite useful, a network protocol, but also an embedded system, for example. By using a state machine, developers can quite easily design, debug, and maintain the software more effectively. Another benefit of it is it provides a way to implement complex behaviors in a modular and extensible way. So what does that mean? For example, uh, you can design your events and inputs in certain ways without having to just modify the entire code, which is sometimes necessary, especially in examples I'm going to show you. So it just makes it much easier to go ahead, add new functionality, but also modify the existing behavior and the entire system without having to really 
care about, am I gonna break something somewhere else? Because yeah, your code is modular, it's written in states, which means everything you do, every state has its own objective, so only that objective should, should execute, and if that doesn't work, you know where the problem is. And overall, it's just a yeah, useful tool for software engineers to be able to simply simplify complex systems and provide a clear and structured approach. So, state machine consists on, on a few components, which are states. For example, if you have a traffic light, you can have a few states which are red, yellow, and green. That's yeah, quite straightforward. And then we have transitions. So let's say, uh, what are transitions? The transitions are like, for example, you go from red to green, from green to yellow. And of course, in the perfect light, you also go the other way around. But then we have something called events. Events are yeah, triggers that cause transactions, uh, transitions. Sorry, events, yeah. Triggers that cause trans transitions. Name an example for that in the traffic light. So let's say a pedestrian walks up to a traffic light, he pushes the button. That is an event and that causes the light for the cars going from green to uh, yellow to red. So that's just a basic example of what events are. And other benefits are also, you can visually quite easily describe what is happening in your entire flow in certain ways of like, hey, a state diagram, state table, state chart. And that's often, in certain complex systems, makes it much easier to introduce someone to the code base instead of having them to read through the entire code base and having to figure out yeah, everything. Because most of us all are developers and we all know writing documentation isn't something we like and that doesn't always happen or there's just no time for it. So, small summary. State machine is a mathematical model that describes the behavior of its states in response to certain, yeah, that describes the states and transitions based on certain input or events that happen throughout the entire flow. And it's just a more robust, reliable, and predictable way to write your software. So why are we using one in the first place? So we've got something, a solution that we have, and that yeah, if you're interested in it, you can always look at it. Maybe some sales. <laughs> but why are we using one? We've got something that's called the Document AI Proxy. It is a solution built on Google Cloud that allows us to process and scale a tremendous amount of documents through existing models such as Document AI that Document AI provides can be invoices, OCR, etc., but also custom models. It also allows you to have a finite number of processing flows. Since we've yeah, got our own state machine, we can define how a certain document should flow through something. And of course, it allows you also to have a customization of single documents. And at first, when I joined, this was written in Java. And yeah, let's say I wasn't really an expert in Java at the first place. But the way that it was designed, it was very bloated. That means for each customer, so we had to just pick the source code from another customer, drop it somewhere else, and start coding that way. And that was just yeah, not good enough. And besides that, we used quite a lot of serverless functionality on Google Cloud. And Java wasn't really working with that if we had a use case that needed to be synchronous and fast. For example, with App Engine, we had certain scenarios where it would just take from 10 to 20 seconds just to simply start up the entire Java application. And if you need something that needs to be fast, yeah, that's just not reliable. So one weekend, I was like, there's two solutions we need to fix. One, I want to write Go. I don't want to write Java anymore. <laughs> But for that, we had issue. I didn't really find any proper and yeah, any proper state machines written in Go that allowed us to just have what we want straight out of the box. Of course, you can always extend one, but the ways th those were written were just not good enough for our use case. So 
I decided to reinvent the wheel and I came up with a yeah, small state machine that we just can form, yeah, can do whatever we want with. Because yeah, we know how it works internally and we can just go ahead at any, any functionality that is necessary for our yeah, processes that we need to perform. So, and this is an example of the entire flow that some of those yeah, proxies need to go through. So as you can see, in the middle is our Doc.ai proxy. We have a lot of things that happen, one, within our proxy, but also happen outside. So we also use a state machine to be able to resume at a point where we need to, so maybe let's expl explain this better. Let's say if you want to send a document to document AI, for example, it's an outgoing call, which means if we go back to the proxy, we have to find a way to resume at that point and it ju not just go say and go ahead, redo this entirely. Of course, this can simply be done by having tons of uh, API calls, but if we can have some way that we can just reuse everything we have, build modular components that we can reuse for clients and we don't have to rewrite again, we can, yeah, it's something that works much better. So, yeah, probably doesn't make a lot of sense, this diagram, but it was a pain to do this in Java, to be honest. And now, let's start looking at some actual code. Because, yeah, that's the most fun part of this presentation. And so first, we need to take a look at a way of defining our configuration. The way Spring does this, for example, I don't know if I said it, but our Java version was using Spring Boot, their state machine, because they also have one. And I'm not saying it's bad, but it's just too much for our use case. And yeah, sometimes it was just too slow. So. We need a way to define our states and transitions. Spring does this in the code itself, but I decided to opt for a way that we can just assign this in a YAML file. I know not everyone enjoys using YAML files. There's a love-hate relationship in the dev community about it, but for this, it seemed like the most easiest choice, especially if you want to write a configuration yourself from scratch. Of course, that comes with the caveat of if you want to have some advanced functionality, it's quite easy to come to the limits of the syntax of YAML. Of course, yeah, syntax of YAML is just strings, basically. But yeah, for certain scenarios, if you, for example, want to take a look at conditionals, it's quite hard to represent that in a proper way inside the YAML file. But yeah, writing a custom parser for it seems a bit over-engineered. So, we need to define our states. How do we do that? We give a string, well, we assign a local variable to the function path. Uh, this allows us to make our configuration look much easier to work with and also a better overview. And using the path is of course necessary for the mapping for that from the function to the actual function that needs to be there, that is within the code. Um, so as you can see in this example, pointer. Okay. Uh, so here we have a non-packaged module, which is basically just your main package. And in here we have one that is actual custom module. As you can see, you will need to put the entire module in front of it because that is necessary for the um, mapping, but also include any yeah, pointer receivers, for example, that your functions might have. So next we have to create our transitions. How do we do that? Yeah, since we can have multiple flows in a state machine, that means we can just assign, okay, the name of our flow, and then we can go ahead and say key value based on flow A to flow B is just, yeah, so your key is flow A, then we go to flow B, which is, yeah, your value. And maybe to go back to how to actually retrieve your function path, Go has a nice little function for that, which is basically runtime.func for PC and then basically pointing to a value of your function. And then we are able to retrieve a pointer and the name of the function. 
And some of you have might noticed, yeah, there's a flaw in this way of doing it. Because what happens if we put after the transition F1 hello to F1 world, and we put behind it F1 world to F1 foo? Yeah, the state machine will just simply run in an endless loop. But even though you could quite easily fix that, there's not really a scenario for us that that could have happened. Since each state has their own objective, we need to look at... Yeah, there's not really a reason to have states that always have to reappear. Since they have their own objective and, their need their, and they have their kind of own data. But that doesn't change the fact that there are certain necessary functions that need to be happen that need to happen after every single state, so every single transition. So we can just implement a function for that which easily allows us to have repeated states. Uh, so maybe an example of a function that needs to be repeated, let's say all your states use the same objects throughout the entire flow and that objects need to be stored in a database. Okay, we can just say we need our, yeah, we can just write in our YAML file, okay, we need an update handler and we have a function path to that specific function that needs to be triggered. State machine will then pick that up and will execute the function always after every state has happened and call that function. So, which can easily be just insert this in a database, for example. Um, and of course, yeah, since we don't really care about the order of your states in here, in the transitions, we need to assign a root state, which can just be using the flow name and then the actual root states that we need. Uh, one more thing to mention here. In the beginning, I talked about events. And events is something that I haven't really specified in here since the events that our use cases mostly have are just HTTP calls or GRCP calls. So there's not really a reason why I saw that I needed to put this stuff inside our, um, yeah, in our configuration file. Because that's from, yeah, project to project, it differs. So you could easily just do this as an update handler or an error handler to reoccur, but yeah, that's not really necessary for us. So now let's take a quick look at the actual config structure. As you can see, we store our uh, states, transitions, and root states as a map. Or transitions, yeah, a more ugly looking map, but. And then there's also a few other fields available, such as last state, skip state. Those are just internal things we will need in yeah, a further stage. And then we have yeah, our state updater, error handler. Those are just custom functions that we can implement that reoccur after every yeah, state or an error happens. And then also a few values, such as values, temporary values, and results. Values and temporary values can be used throughout all the states and transitions to just transport values from one state to another because we put them in a context and they will get moved over the entire, yeah, through the entire process. And results can be used to just insert a pointer to a variable and that can be used for synchronous states if we have some. Then we can just, if there's a result at the end, we retrieve the result using, yeah, we just fill the result in with the pointer so that's quite easy. And then, of course, we have um, two functions. The reason why you see, yeah, it's not really that visible, but I've kind of implemented it in a way because often each project also has other projects related configuration variables, so we can just put them also in the same config file, which is quite yeah, easy that you don't have to, that you don't need two config files to read at startup because yeah, that's just unnecessary time wasted. So we can just do this. Um, so now that we established looking, yeah, how to do the configuration, we can look at the actual setup. For this, we have two options. 
we can either preload everything or start at, or do our stuff at runtime. Preloading means that we just, yeah, at startup, for example, in our initialization function, we can just say, okay, machine.preload, we give our config, we insert a new state machine with all the available functions that you have related in your project, and that's it. And then in another function, we can just go ahead and start our state machine by calling the correct flow since we can have multiple flows. But is it really necessary to do this at startup time? No, since we're not really doing any heavy computing, of course, yeah, the more states you have, the longer it will take, but yeah, as you can see in this benchmark, it only takes a thousand nanoseconds, which is basically nothing. But yeah, every performance gain, yeah, is a win-win scenario for certain use cases. But that doesn't mean that doing stuff at runtime isn't useful, because for example, if you would take a look at game development, there's not a really a reason for a game, if they were to using state machines for their functions, to load every mission. No, that sentence didn't make sense. Um, so if we look at game development, it's not necessarily that each mission at runtime needs to be, yeah, initialized at startup. So for example, a user, yeah, a player walks up to a mission, executes a mission, something that we can do in runtime. And it doesn't really take that long. Um, so now let's actually take a look at the preload function itself. So our input is our config and a state machine. But yeah, it's quite odd that we already need the input of a state machine because we're trying, just trying to create one. But what that input actually is, is a, coming from this new state machine function. Yeah, my pointer does not seem to work. But. So if we take a look at this function, we can see already see what the layout, well, what input and output variables our state machine function should have, which is basically a context, and our output is a context error. Um, yeah, so what do we do in here basically? Okay, we just create a new state machine structure and for that we need to register all our functions which basically is, okay, let's retrieve the name of the function and the actual pointer to the, and the actual function that we are able to call it. So, then we go back to the preload function and we basically create a map and we iterate over all our flows that we found in our config. And then we go ahead at our states and our transitions. And of course, we need to make sure that do we even, yeah, we need to double check is this function, uh, is this state, which is always a function in our scenario, is it available? Because we cannot call any state that is not available in our code. And same for the transitions and the root states. And then we just append that to the uh, to the map, and then we just return it. And we have preloaded our entire uh, yeah, state machines. Um, maybe to look a bit more at why am I using a context in this scenario. So, because we've got a lot of outgoing API calls, it's also a perfect way for us to use a context because we can just reuse that context throughout our other flows. Our other microservices can use the same context because we just sent that over and reuse it. And of course, also because our request scoped values perfectly, it's just a perfect match for our scenario. So no reason to try something else there. Um, so yeah, these are just the basic add state, set root state and add transition functions, which just retrieves, uh, checks if it is it uh, is it available. If not, yeah, let's return error, and then we just add it into the state machine itself. So now let's actually take a look at running the state machine. So the set root, it's basically just a loop. But in this loop, before we run this loop, we basically check, hey, is this a synchronous, uh, yeah, is this state machine running synchronous, yes or not? 
because yeah, we've got scenarios like that. But if not, first we're gonna retrieve our config. Then we're gonna say, okay, the last state that we just called is our, yeah, so the current state that we just called is gonna be our last state, because of course we need to keep track of this. Did we maybe get an instruction to skip states? Yes or no? If so, yeah, we're gonna <coughs> skip the state. If not, yeah, do nothing. And then we will just retrieve our next state. Of course, we need to check, are we in the last state or not? Assign that in our yeah, config. And then we can actually go ahead and call our function. Then we can check, hey, did an error occur in there? Yes or no? Then we can go ahead, try to check, is it maybe an error on purpose? So an exit error, which yeah, we don't need to keep a sta state machine alive if we have an outgoing asynchronous call, since we can just say, okay, let's, let's kill the state machine because we need, don't need to use any resources for no reason. And it's kind of same for the update handler, which we then just say, okay, do we maybe need to pass the update or not? If so, let's trigger this custom st uh, state updater. And that's kind of how the state machine works. It's fairly easy, but yeah, the first time I thought about writing a state machine was like, when you look it up, what is the definition of a state machine? It looks a mathematical, what was the name again? Uh, so a mathematical model. Yes, basically it is, but if you want to implement it yourself, it's just very easy to do. And it just brings also a lot of benefits to using it, especially in our scenario. So yeah, just a win-win and it's kind of worked because hey, the entire project is written in Go now, so I can just write Go the entire day, which is perfect. And that was kind of it. Maybe a small fun fact, since we use those uh, function paths, if you just have a repository sitting somewhere else and that has the inputs of a context and the output of a context and error, we can just go ahead and import that function and it doesn't even need to be in our code. Of course, Go will import it in the Go sum, but hey, that means your code, you can reuse code from anywhere else. And that was my presentation, so I guess, are there any questions? Wait, can you repeat it? Sure. So, um, if you have a large application mm -hmm. in its own, how do you, um, do you have like, how do you um, compartmentalize the separate logic bits? Uh, in yeah. So, what I, yeah, I don't have the repository, an example repository on me right now, but the way I kind of structured it is you've got, yeah, a folder called states, and in there we have basically per file a state. Because, yeah, most of the time the objectives are totally different because, for example, we have got upload.go, which basically is the entire state that needs to happen to upload a file. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, that's kind of the way I do it most of the time. Of course, if it's a lesser big project, you can put everything in between. Well, put everything maybe in one file. You don't have to split up everything, but this, that's also kind of a way I like writing Go is just splitting up everything in files that kind of mesh together. So I hope that kind of answers your question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in the previous slide you had the, the, the code where you call a function and I was wondering if you have any thing uh, to prevent uh, or if you, this function panic. That is actually handled in another way where we call, well, in our main thread, we can easily just, I don't have the snippet with me right here, but we can easily kind of prevent from going into panic mode. We can, wait, how to say that? Uh, a while back I found a, yeah, a 
snippet of code that allowed us to go in the main thread and actually also find a way to capture any panics that would occur. So if a panic would occur, we can also say like, hey, do this, maybe log it somewhere, go ahead. But since, of course, this state machine is running in a separate thread, each state machine is running in a separate thread, it will never involve taking the application entirely down with it. Any other questions? Yeah, so the reason we're not using a custom struct is because those variables that we need to input in there always differ from project to project. Because it can be maybe a value that we need to transport, which could be like, hey, it's uh, maybe the binary of an entire file. Or it's just a few objects that are coming from a database, which is... Wait, I think... Uh, yeah, so that's kind of the reason we just went with a context and not a custom type because even though if we have those custom fields like values, temporary values, we can still put them inside yeah, a structure that comes from a library and then we just say, hey, use this structure instead of our context in our function. But it's more so that it just allows us to use the context, not only in our application, but allows us to send it to other API calls from microservices that we have and reuse all the variables, variables that are inside instead of having to unmarshal, et cetera. So that's kind of the reason, reasoning why we went with the context. That would also be a possibility, which, yeah, if I think about it, might also make sense. But, yeah, for this to make it not too complicated at the beginning, because at first this was kind of a POC to see can we even go towards this, and it's kind of kept that way. It, yeah, just made sen more sense to just use reflection in that, because I know, yeah, reflection is considered very heavy in resources. But I think for a use case like this, especially if you were to preload your functions, it doesn't really matter that much. So thank you for listening. I hope it was interesting and I yeah.